everybody. Thank you for being here in the Regeneration 2030 days. And we are in this roundtable about uh, uh, regenerative cities and sustainable urbanization. I think it's a really important uh, question nowadays to understand how cities can implement uh, the, the roadmap to the sustainability. And for this reason, we will have uh, um, different point of view from uh, uh, panelists. So we will have uh, Benno Albrecht, that is a professor in Venice, and he is leading the Urbicide Task Force. Then we have uh, Thomas De Lara, that is a co-founder and co-lead of Cities Can Be in Brazil, in Rio de Janeiro. Then we have Uma Fitzgerald, that is a chairman of the Nigerian Institute of Architecture in Lagos, and Nana Memparishvili, that is the president of ECAMT, uh, of ECOM International Council. ECAMT is the International Committee for Architecture and Techniques. And Christina, Caterina Sarfatti, that is program director of SIG40, based in Milan. And uh, Fabrizio Storti, that is in person here with me. Thank you, Fabrizio. <laughs> so I'm not alone in this uh, huge uh, uh, stage. And he is a professor of structural geology at the University of Parma, but he is also prorector uh, of the university. Yes. So we will uh, uh, hear um, not all this point of view in order to understand how uh, the cities and the urbanization can manage uh, this. Uh, perspective until achieve a sustainable environment. And uh, let's start with Benno Albrecht. Uh, he's, as I told, uh, uh, in Venice, he's based in Venice, he's a professor, he works in sustainability from several years, uh, and he wrote a really important book. Maybe, Benno, you can uh, give us some, uh, uh, something about this book and uh, about sustainability many years ago. Maybe it's one of the first books uh, telling a history about sustainability. So thank you, Ben, uh, for being here. And so I want to share with you some of um, uh, the last of our, our works uh, that we are working in um, with the university, well, my university is UF University in Venice. Actually, we are working with the International UN Organization for studying a new design paradigm for reconstruction of uh, urban settlements and built environments. Following conflicts, uh, social problems, natural disasters, uh, in some areas uh, under very under pressure. And we know that today, national and transnational actors operate with a top-down approach that promotes large financial loans to large companies, large-scale infrastructure, and very few or no participation. The alternative is a bottom-up strategy that starts, we think, for very small loans to many people, the gradual credit uh, becomes an instrument of regeneration that triggers circular and sustainable changes. And we think also community participation. The top-down approach is a vertical order divided in layers, in different layers, such as uh, infrastructure, education, health, and so on. <laughs> Well, which mean there are many problems in terms of coordination, execution, timing, uh, to lead a, a very incomplete reconstruction of cities. The bottom-up approach is a strategy where an organic system of urban cells that allows the complete reconstruction of the, of the city as a sum of self-contained element. The cellular reconstruction propose an off-grid approach that aims to lower energy, uh, waste production, uh, and uh, through, we think, a, a wise use of local resources and advanced technology, technological solutions. 
And so a, a comparison between uh, the old paradigm and the new one we call reconstruct strategy clearly show that the new model is more effective in terms of use of resources of, of social economical impact. The process of construction of each urban cell is based on a growing evolutionary mechanism that starts from new reconstruction laboratories. These laboratories enable local communities to get the necessary operational tools for a bottom-up reconstruction. Uh, and so different, uh, we, we can rebuild different building can be constructed by small local company, construction companies trained in the use of new recycle and waterless and so on sustainable material. Also, the, a new, there is a new approach of mobility that allows to a complete reshaping of the urban fabric without the necessity to follow the traditional in a very ineffective top-down design. And so, for example, we are now working in, in, in Syria for the post-war reconstruction. And in Syria, it's possible to identify the best areas of intervention with an algorithm, with a mathematical formula, based on the analysis of a complex series of data and uh, parameters. And so, so if you, if you with the zoom, uh, zooming in, in, into Damascus area, we see how the optimization forecast the timing for each intervention. The use of a mathematical algorithm allows to modify the geometry of the intervention on the basis of new data, allowing to tailor, really tailor the process continuously uh, evolving, evolving needs with the evolving needs. And so we propose to design and implement a reconstruction process based on a ecosystem of plans and interventions. This process can be applied in many place, places under pressures, taking into consideration the characteristic of each part of different uh, territories and landscapes. The links between different parts form a complex cellular system of intervention as water system, agricultural landscapes, uh, and so on. And so, <clears throat> uh, for, for example, sustainable light production, uh, energetic uh, environment, uh, that are all interconnected elements that must be considered all together, like you can see here. And uh, the final goal of this work is the construction of a series of urban cells built with an evolutionary approach. We think that this new approach is decisive for the reconstruction of territories destroyed by wars, by climate, and by social changes. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. It was really clear, this speech. And um, yes, I think we have to imagine how cities can uh, also be uh, guided uh, and connecting the peaceful places uh, and uh, sustainability. And is a new uh, thematic that we are happy to have uh, here in uh, uh, Regeneration 2030. Uh, I would like to pass the stage to Nana Memparishvili. She is the uh, president of ICAM, the International Committee of Architecture and Techniques of the International Council of Museum. Of, uh, we, this institution uh, belongs to the UN, and she will uh, um, make us uh, possible to see how we can lead a true museum to cultural institution this transition to sustainability. Nana? Hello. Hello from Georgia. Uh, thank you, Madalena, for the introduction. I'm, uh, first, I would like to say that I'm very glad to be a part of this uh, big event. 
and a big movement, Generation 2030. And I would like to thank uh, every organizers and people who invite me to uh, join this event. The topic I would like to talk to today <clears throat> is uh, uh, happiness and uh, museums. Uh, why museums and uh, what they have in common with the people happiness? I will try to explain my point of view now. Let me uh, share my screen. Museum and happiness. Museums and happiness. Uh, let me introduce uh, institutions. Uh, Madalena already said two words about them. So it's ECOM and ECAMT. Uh, ECOM is the um, International Council of Museums. The date, date of creation is uh, 1946, and uh, it has um, 19 national committees, 32 international committees. It's a huge organization caring about museums and museum well-beings and museum sustainability, and has uh, more than uh, 40,000 members from um, 141 countries and territories. And the ECOM uh, is a, one of the first committees of ECOM. It's about uh, architecture and museum techniques. And we have, we are, uh, uh, the date of creation of our committee, committee is 1949. We are one of the first committees of ECOM, and we have 670 individual and institutional members nowadays. So here are ECOM mission, uh, and I don't want to read it now, everything, but uh, it has five uh, main missions. Establish standards of excellence, lead a diplomatic forum, develop a professional network, lead a global think tank, and carry out international missions. And uh, uh, ECAMT also has um, uh, his missions. There are six, but I would like to underline two of them. This is to formulate and carry out a program of activities related to museum architecture and exhibition techniques, and to provide advice to ECOM on issues related to museum planning, architecture and exhibition, as well as the historic structures that represent various architectural heritage. Uh, used as museums. So, why museums matter? Uh, actually, they always matter since uh, in ancient Greece, when the sculptures of conquerors, battle trophies, means of war, and uh, uh, different gifts were exhibited in Greek treasure chambers. Also, since the Middle Ages, when so-called studiolos uh, rooms, uh, not only protected objects, but also uh, we are used for educational purposes. They were uh, very important since uh, the 16th century, when uh, Uffizi was transferred to gallery and play a huge role in the establishment of national identity and community education. And in since 18th uh, century, when the Louvre was opened for public first, and the wealth of kind and the church uh, became available the uh, church became available for public and uh, since then uh, these words available to public is very important for a uh, museum uh, community and uh, may is an essential component of the museum definition according to the ecom definition so why museums matter Nowadays, museum buildings, as you can see here, the very different and very uh, beautiful images for museum buildings. The buildings itself became a, uh, like a museum exponents, and people are going to see uh, the museum buildings itself. And what is more, museum affects the development of cities. Uh, they can be new, muse new city landmarks. Uh, museums are symbols of the world cities, just as an Eiffel Tower for Paris. Uh, they can be new catalysts, new destinations, new multi-urban centers, new spaces for artists, and new old urban reintegrations. When a uh, city strives to preserve the historical buildings, and the museums are also trying to integrate in city urban net then old existing buildings are adapted to new requirements like uh, Tate Modern, for instance, for instance, our Museum d'Orsay in Paris, which is located in the old railway station building. Uh, 
uh, what is more, museum affect on the quality of human life. Uh, museums are permanent institutions in serve of society and its development, and the role of museums are to collect, describe, preserve, research and exhibit the tangible and intangible heritage of humanity and its environment for the purposes of education, study and enjoyment. But, the, but in the last decades, uh, uh, the demand from the visitors and also new challenges uh, make museums uh, uh, to move to uh, make people more relaxed, to have fun also, and these roles also added to museum roles. And today visiting museums is positively associated with a higher level of happiness. So uh, this is from the left side, this is a, a museum definition according to the ECOM status adopted uh, in uh, 2007. Museum is a non-profit permanent institution in service of society and its development, open to the public, which occurs, conserves, researches, communicates and exhibits the tangible and intangible heritage of humanity and its environment for the purposes of education, study and enjoyment. And uh, now uh, ECOM is working on a new definition, which is not ready yet, but we work together very hard. Uh, and uh, some words and phrases from this new definition are democracy, inclusiveness, guarantee equal rights, uh, participatory and transparent, and so on and so on. Uh, so this is a, a new demands from new era and new challenges for museums today. And uh, today, during the last year, uh, museum has museums all over the world has uh, new challenges because of this COVID situation. And um, according to UNESCO report, uh, which was published on May to, uh, this year, uh, we have uh, 85,000 museums in the world. And um, uh, according to the summary of findings from a museum survey done by ECOM uh, because of COVID-19 pandemic, in April almost 95% uh, of them were closed and uh, during the lockdown many museums and changed their digital activities. Also many, also many museums already had uh, this uh, kind of communication. Uh, most museum professionals worked remotely uh, and the permanent employees seems uh, compared to really stable. But had, however, the situation for freelance museum professionals was very alarming uh, and the situation was very hard. But in summer, museums uh, started to reopen their doors again, but the situation is not very uh, stabilized for uh, this time as well. So we will have a very uh, hard uh, next years uh, in our sphere. And um, ECOM, representing an, the international museum community, calls on policy and decision makers to urgently allocate relief funds to assist museums and their professionals so that they, they can survive the crisis and continue their vital public service mission. The recovery of economies and the healing process for our societies after the COVID-19 crisis will be long and complex, but uh, we have to do everything uh, for uh, surviving and make sustainable these very important institutions become, because museums are key pro protagonists in local development and as in comparable places for people to meet and learn, we uh, will have an important role to play in rebuilding the local economy and repairing the social fabric of affected communities. So it was what I would like to share with you today and I am open for uh, any discussion and any actions Thank in you, this Nana. direction. Thank you very Thank much. You. It was really, really clear and uh, uh, comprehensive. I would like to pass now uh, to Thomas Delara. He's the co-founder and co-lead of Cities Can Be. They are based in Rio de Janeiro and they, are, and they are a network of cities. But let's hear what he has to tell us now. Okay. Honored to be here in the conversation about regeneration. Uh, our movement uh, is called Cities Can Be and we like to say that we are trying uh, our very best to crowdsource the SDGs, which is bring about 
most uh, people uh, to join and to work towards the SDGs. So, as you know, Ban Ki-moon, the big articulator of the SDGs, uh, used to say that our struggle for global sustainability will be won or lost in cities. And we know that cities need uh, to regenerate social tissue because we have so much polarization. And of course, we have to regenerate biodiversity as we are losing lots of our biodiversity and the integrity of our biosphere. So regeneration is a very important word for all of us now and to regenerate in cities is a very crucial point also. So basically our movement started in Rio back in 2016 on 2017, just to give a little bit of story, uh, Santiago de Chile and Mendoza and Argentina joined the movement. And in 2019, uh, four new cities, uh, Asuncion in Paraguay, Córdoba also in Argentina, and we started also in uh, Europe uh, with Edinburgh can be, uh, and Barcelona also. So uh, basically what we are doing is uh, to bring about millions of people to collaborate uh, towards the SDGs. And one of the tools that we have now, it is a tool called the SDG Action Manager. It's a tool that comes from a collaboration between uh, United Nations Global Compact and the B Corp movement. And this tool is a tool that helps company to understand what are the SDGs that their core business can work towards and can uh, start to have actions towards the SDG. So it's an online free tool for any type of company from any size, any country. It's available on the internet and companies can uh, get to know what are the SDGs that their own core business are affecting and they can know what are the actions that they can take. So this is a very uh, important tool which uh, helped us to bring business as a force for good. And this is the, the motto of the B Corp movement. And when we bring the power of the market to be change making and to bring transformative and positive change, uh, that is our uh, big vision. So just to give an example, uh, Danone, which is a global company, already uses the SDG Action Manager. As you can see here in the chart, in the bottom right, you can see the SDGs and different actions. And those actions are connected to their brand model and their business model. So it's, uh, it's crucial to their uh, strategy and to their uh, value as a company to be aligned with the SDGs and to do uh, concrete actions towards the SDGs. So this tool is being used by Danone in a global scale right now. So just to give a, a brief example uh, on our engagement with civic society, Usa tu poder in Spanish or Portuguese, uh, it's called use your power. So in Santiago can be, we developed this project which we invited 25 different uh, influencers, uh, public people uh, that are very well known, YouTubers, the big astrophysicists of Chile, different artists uh, and actresses to choose their SDG and to be promoters and say, yes, you can use your power to be a change maker on your city. And I choose this SDG, either SDG, and I will promote it and I will talk about it in, in my family, with friends. So it was an invitation for civic society and citizens to get to know the SDGs. These SDGs were printed in metro cards in more than 150,000 metro cards of Santiago de Chile. They were invited citizens to draw arts and also to write sentences about each of the SDGs. And those art and sentences was uh, uh, or, uh, selected by the public and was printed in metal cards and also in more than 100 bus stops around the city. So, uh, sorry, here's the, the bus stop. So just to uh, take a look on the big effort and collaboration that was done between local government, uh, national government, large uh, multinational companies, uh, NGOs, uh, UNDP from the United Nations, uh, even activist organizations that were uh, together working towards a better uh, Santiago and were using SDGs to communicate. Because in the end, the SDGs are a common global language. It's our first big, wide, common global language. Right, so uh, we have uh, 
been able to invite more than 750 companies to assess their impact and uh, environmental and social issues. Thousands of uh, new activists uh, began to work and uh, talk about SDGs. Nine universities, in the case of Mendoza, were working together in an inter-university collaboration to talk about SDGs, to talk about B Corps, which are business using uh, uh, their power of a market to change society. We have in Mendoza the first uh, law for triple impact public procurement, which means that companies uh, that were assessing their social and environmental impact, they had priority of the government to be uh, selected and to be uh, used for uh, developing the society. And also we were able to fundraise more than 3, 000, uh, 3 million and $500,000 to mobilize the SDGs. We are launching in December five uh, Creative Commons book, which will uh, share our experience in this, uh, the seven cities nowadays. And I just want to pass a very quick uh, video. Uh, it's one minute and a half. I hope you can see the audio about uh, collaboration. After this wake up call, cities all across Europe will need extreme collaboration to achieve our goal of creating vibrant, fair and regenerative communities supported by businesses who are working for the local common benefit. Cuando termine la cuarentena, aquí en Barcelona, vamos a requerir de colaboración extrema para resolver las desigualdades sociales, sobre todo en el frente del empleo, del desempleo. Aquí en São Paulo, más do que nunca, Precisaríamos da colaboração extrema para a construção de um sistema econômico mais inclusivo, mais equitativo, mais regenerativo e mais consciente para todos. Quando a epidemia atual será terminada, a Genève, nós vamos precisar de colaboração extrema para melhorar os transportes comuns e, portanto, a qualidade do ar. Depois da emergência do coronavírus, em Roma, teremos necessidade de máxima colaboração para favorecer uma represa econômica sustentável. Quando esse wake-up call is over, here in Edinburgh, UK, we need extreme collaboration to make a city for everybody. Civilizations have been defined in BC and AC, and now we're entering AC 2.0 after Corona, where we can eradicate poverty and bring about environmental sustainability towards our goals locally and also globally. Ayúdanos a compartir lo que hemos aprendido en Ciudades Más B. Help us share what we've learned in Cities Can Be. Basically, that's it. Uh, it's a big call that we are seeing from different cities that are bringing about the culture of extreme collaboration towards toward the SDG. So that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Thomas. It was really impressive what you, you did. And uh, I agree, we have to well communicate the content and the sustainability uh, SDGs uh, to the people and the cities have a very important role and impact. So now, uh, please, Caterina Sarfatti, may you connect and uh, give your um, expertise to us. I know that you are also a network of cities based in Milan. Um, hello, uh, good morning everybody and thank you, good afternoon, um, thank you very much for uh, having me today, um, it's, it's, it's a pleasure and thank you for the organizer for inviting me. Um, so just a couple of words on, on C40, first of all. Um, we, um, we are, uh, for those who, who don't know C40 cities, we are a network of mayors, first and foremost, um, a network of 97 mayors of the um, mega cities uh, and uh, big cities of the world. So um, we represent from the mayor of New York to the mayor of Beijing, uh, and everything that is in, in, in between. Um, and it's a network of mayors that has been launched by um, the former mayor of London, Ken Livingston, in 2005, uh, with uh, 12, 13 mayors at the time, uh, basically saying one uh, key truth that then has been reiterated by the science and the research in the following years, which is we will not be able to 
tackle and solve the climate crisis if we don't start from cities. Um, and uh, from then on, uh, the, the, the network has grown massively and now represents a quarter of the global GDP and more than 700 million people across the world. Uh, and as you can imagine, uh, when these mayors get together and join forces to take action on climate and therefore to take action on sustainability and regeneration, um, and to take and also to express their voices on, on climate and so to jointly come join forces for lobby and advocacy on the importance of raising the ambition of climate action and tackling the climate crisis, uh, they are much more powerful than when they do it alone. Um, they can shift markets, they can prove that solutions for tackling the climate break, breakdown uh, exist. Um, so on one hand, they can um, uh, produce impact on the ground, uh, reducing emission and increasing the benefits of climate action. And on the other hand, they can very powerfully ask for more ambition um, at national and global level. And they have been doing this uh, for, for the past years. Um, uh, uh, one of my sort of favorite examples um, was when the mayors of the network uh, during the COP21 in Paris have been instrumental um, to raise the ambition of the Paris Agreement and ensure that the objective of the world to tackle the climate crisis uh, was um, ensuring that global warming and global heating would not be beyond 1.5 degrees centigrade. And they did this two years before the science and the IPCC and the sort of scientific community uh, said that in order to avoid climate breakdown uh, and in order to avoid millions of, of, of people dying from climate breakdown, we need to stay well below two degrees uh, global warming. Um, so that's that's sort of what uh, what what the network aims at doing is sort of having mayors support them each other and cities support each other uh, to deliver ambitious climate action on the ground, but also um, to to call for action um, other other levels of government and, and other levels of institutions. And a very recent example that I wanted to share with you today is an example uh, is a, a recent initiative that that C40 has coordinated, um, uh, which called the mayoral task force for a green and just recovery and basically um, uh, what it what it is what it was what it is is 11 mayors chaired by um, the the mayor of Milan Giuseppe Sala with mayors from all over the world from from the mayor of Medellin New Orleans Montreal um, um, uh, sorry, I'm blanking, uh, Rotterdam, Lisbon, um, Seoul, uh, Freetown, Melbourne, so really across all over the world, have joined forces in the middle of the pandemic, um, basically saying um, we know that the key priority of us and of our cities is protecting the health and well-being of our citizens, but it's also ensuring that the recovery from the pandem pandemic is green and just, is sustainable and equitable. And, that, and the only way to really recover and to really uh, uh, make sure that um, the recovery in cities is beneficial uh, for people, for the, for the nature, for, for the planet, but in particular for people, their health and their well-being, the only way is to really address investments and policies for the recovery to sustainability, to climate action, um, and to equitable climate action. And therefore, they have pushed forward this vision, uh, which has been um, embedded also by the UN Secretary General in his report on the pandemic and the recovery from the pandemic. Um, many, uh, not many, some national governments, some media, and some other levels of institutions have embedded this idea of a green and just recovery following the work of the task force. Um, but beyond sort of establishing a vision, which of course is very important, but doesn't solve uh, problems, they also have identified um, key actions that can be taken by cities at local level um, that, are, um, that have great impacts on emission reduction, of course, but also on jobs, resilience and equity. Uh, and um, in, in the set of actions, I, I just wanted to sort of give a few examples, uh, for ex which, which, which are, for example, 
really investing in um, buildings efficiency and green uh, and green buildings in cities, which have an incredible impact on the, of course, emission reduction in cities, but also on job creation um, and uh, local job creation at city level. Um, second, but not less important, mass transit. We have seen. Uh, uh, due to the pandemic, that the transit system in cities have been put uh, to an incredible strain, um, with agencies uh, managing the mass transit system in great crisis, um, and therefore um, calling out and, and, and making mass transit more safe, more accessible, um, and more frequent uh, in cities uh, is a key priority, not just for the response to the pandemic, but also for the recovery in terms of emission reduction, air quality, and job creation. And last but not least, we have seen a real movement in cities of giving back public space and green space to people uh, and to um, uh, to people and to citizens and to residents, uh, from creating sort of temporary bike lanes and, wa and walking infrastructure to, to uh, making them permanent um, and to sort of increasing the greening and the planting of trees in cities. We've really seen a, a sort of a movement of mayors. Uh, really prioritizing giving back the public space to people as not just a way of responding to the pandemic, but also as a, as a way of recovering from it. Um, all of this said, and I'm concluding with this, uh, all of this said, what it's really clear from um, our work with these mayors and their um, their their work on the recovery, which if you're more interested on, you can find on, on, our, on our website with the agenda, the report, and, and everything that has been produced by the task force. What is really clear is that as um, a great Italian philosopher said uh, um, some years ago, uh, the climate transition, the ecological transition that the world needs so much uh, cannot be effective if it's not socially desirable. And this is even more true in the, in the aftermath and in the middle of a global pandemic. Um, and therefore, um, um, it, it, is, it is really key that, uh, on one hand, uh, not just that we demonstrate that um, recovery funds uh, that are addressed to green are also the best way of producing more jobs, protecting the health of people, and increasing well-being in cities, but also that we ensure that whatever climate policy is delivered uh, at local level and at all levels of government is also equitable, is also just, and we ensure a just transition uh, for those workers and for those people that don't necessarily benefit from, from climate action at local level. And this is what the mayors of C40s are really engaged with, um, uh, with the um, uh, launch by our chair, Mayor Garcetti, the mayor of Los Angeles, of a global Green New Deal that has been launched um, recently and that uh, mayors are really sort of working on to ensure that this sort of social component and, envir and environmental component is not just advocated for, but it's really implemented in the cities worldwide. Thank you very much for, for having me and happy to respond to questions uh, if, if, if you have them. Thanks. Thank you, Katerina. It's really, really, really interesting and uh, how you find a way to combine cities in a global action is uh, important, I think. And uh, uh, that's why we have also here Uma Fitzgerald. He is a chairman of the Nigerian Institute of Architecture in Lagos. And uh, he brings us uh, a perspective, his perspective, how to change in such megalopoly uh, the vision on urbanism. Uma? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Oh, thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mandelala. I also thank you all and welcome you all. Say good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are. And I'm glad to be here um, today to join in this um, um, conversation. Thank you. Um, we'll be discussing today the city of Lagos now and um, the future. Um, as we know, th this is Lagos. This is... Um, an area view of Lagos, and usually we say, welcome to um, Lagos State, the, the center of um, excellence. Uh, this is my uh, information. Um, my name is Fitzgerald Omar. I'm the chairman of the Nigerian Institute of Architects. I'm a member of the Royal Institute of British Architects and Amer American Institute of uh, Architects. The Lagos Architects Forum um, 
was uh, in, instituted by the Nigerian of Architects Lagos State Chapter in 2009 to bring professionals and architects together to look into the, um, the global problems of um, Lagos State due to the exponential um, growth and to see how we can provide solution um, to the uh, environmental problems um, in Lagos. We hold this program every year to see how we can uh, always hand over solution to the government of um, Lagos State. So these, we, uh, this are some of the pictures of um, the program we had last year, which was a 10th uh, edition. And we'll also summarize some of the things we have achieved in the last um, 11 years. We couldn't hold the, f the program this year due to the um, coronavirus and pandemic. And the next year will be in May 2021. So Lagos State, the city of Lagos State, this is also an area view of the city of Lagos State. Lagos State has over 21 million people living in um, living in it as at um, 2015 census, and it's projected to be in 2020, in 2021, in 2000, the most popular city in the world with over 15 million people living in it. Now the question is, if we continue to live the way we live in Lagos and uh, without good infrastructure this city will probably be the most unlivable city in the world. The fact about Lagos is that Lagos has the fourth biggest economy in Africa after Nigeria, the country, South Africa, and Egypt. So if Lagos was a country, was a country it's, going to be, it's going to have um, um, GDP more than other uh, countries in Africa. And it has the tallest building in, uh, in West Africa with over 150 million, um, 150 uh, meters and the longest bridge in Africa until 1996. So the need for urgent intervention for infrastructure, power, housing and transportation, or else this will be uh, a, the most unlivable city in the world. Now, while we have the problems we have in Lagos, Lagos also have its own beauty and culture. People are very happy. People are always find a way to enjoy themselves despite the problems we have. And it's also a city of great um, arts and culture. Now, look at the problems we have. These are aerial views um, of um, parts of um, Lagos. If we know the popular Makoko, which is known as one of the most popular slum in the world, what challenges and problems do we face in Lagos? Slum, poor, no potable water, poor infrastructure, poor drainage system, poor transportation system, insufficient power and electricity, land pollution, air pollution, water pollution. Now, Lagos has over 1 million vehicles plying the road. Now, let us look at the kind of CO2 emission that we have in this state. We don't have good rail system uh, in the country. So these are major issues that we have tried to see how we can um, solve it in, in Lagos. Now, this is another view of, um, of Lagos. They look at the traffic jam. These are real-time um, pictures of Lagos. Look at the water pollution. This is the Atlantic Ocean, the Lagos um, offflow of the um, Lagos Lagoon, the, um, the Atlantic Ocean. That is the third mainland bridge that I earlier mentioned is the longest bridge in Africa up until 1996. Um, now, uh, what is government doing to ensure that we meet the SDGs goal? The government has, they have a roadmap on policy formulation on how to achieve this SDG goals by 2030. They have different programs like promotion of documentaries, vox pops, promotional material, and partnership with professional bodies and also corporate organizations to see how they can get the 17 SDG goal being a strategy to link to the MDA's uh, statutory role, the ministry. However, we in the professional bodies, we were looking at key um, SDG um, goals, like the goal seven, like the goal nine, like the goal 11 and the goal six. These are areas that affect we, the architect and those in built environment to see how we can support uh, the government to see how they can achieve um, these um, goals. Now, we have tried to look at the well-planned cities, Washington, D.C., in the U.S., Copenhagen, that is planned by the 2025, they have carbon neutral. South Korea, they have centered, um, uh, have grew good green belt. Look at that. We also looked at um, Singapore, uh, Chandigarh in India, and Brasilia. These are, the kind, these are the cities that we're trying to see how we can match Lagos. Lagos should be like these cities by 2030. 
of which if we don't, if we're unable to measure up with all these cities in the world, then we'll have a huge problem with us. Now, what are the hopes? There's a whole lot of hopes in, um, in Lagos. The challenges we have are a whole lot of also opportunities. The government have, have a lot of, um, they've done most master plans for the major areas, the Ekpe, the Lekki, the Badagri area. And also they're trying to reconstruct um, the bus terminals and also doing road expansion. And currently we have um, construction of refineries. Some of these pictures, the, the, the float, if we see this is a floating school done by an individual to see how they can support the students, the children that live in Makoko, the floating, um, the slum in, in, in Lagos. So what, are, what other people have done, and these are the kind of things we're still looking at how Lagos can achieve. We must move from chaos to creativity. Quality of public transport and rapid bus mode. Also look at how 50 people can live, um, 50 square meter space per person. Today, the city participates in a recycling program and more than residents make use of the trash token for exchange of money. So these are some of the things. We also talked about smart housing, sustainable transport mode, incorporation of green areas in the urban fabric, communal biking and green ways, non-profit and social housing to see how we can alleviate the problems of those living in Lagos. Now, solution, population, identify and support the urban poor, housing, improve urban land um, management and low cost housing, water sanitation, water and sanitation service, insensitive water and sanitation and providers amenities, also transport, invest in public transportation that affects and safe for all, air quality, we must improve air quality, government, initiative and increase grants to citizens. These are some of the solutions we think that can happen and this is where we need uh, foreign partners to see how they can collaborate with the governments of Lagos State to see how they can solve the problems we have. Because the budget of the city of, of the state of Lagos, can, the government of Lagos cannot solve the problems we have. That's where we look at um, the government. So this is the kind of the future of Lagos, the kind of future we see in Lagos to make it um, um, a livable city. Thank you very much for um, listening and you can reach out to me for us to see how we can discuss the city of Lagos. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Fitzgerald. It's really important to see uh, a vision of such a uh, big city and how you are trying to manage and to create a, a partnership to achieve these goals. So thank you very much for sharing with us your ideas. And now, finally, <laughs> we have Fabrizio Storti. Finally, because he's in person with me, I'm really happy to have him here. He's a professor of structural geology at the University of Parma, but he also is a, a pro-rector, and uh, he will give us uh, the vision of what the university is doing here in Parma. And I, I'm really honored to have you here and give us this perspective, since we are host in Parma, and Parma uh, is doing a really great job for regeneration. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madalena. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Madalena, also for expl explaining why an expert in rock deformation, as I try to be, is actually here speaking about this uh, subject. I will give you a sh brief overview of the actions that our university is taking in this very broad area of uh, sustainability. First of all, talking ab about Regenerative cities, smart cities, carbon neutrality, circular economy, and so on, means following an uh, awareness pathway of the society, which is a prerequisite for positive achievements. This is uh, what uh, we have also heard in the previous talks, uh, from the previous talks. Universities play a fundamental role for paving such roads. And in Parma, we are well aware of this mission, and our university is strongly engaged for playing a pivotal role to drive the change in our territory. First, the organization of our university includes research structures devoted to this purpose, such as the Excellence Department of Chemistry, Life Sciences and Environmental Sustainability, which is actually my department, the Research Center on Energy and Environment, the Laboratory of Interdisciplinary Research for Environmental Education to Sustainability, 
the Smart City 4.0 Sustainable Lab. Moreover, the university administration includes the Envi Environment, Sustainability and Safety Office and the Sustainable University Working Group, where researchers and technicians collaborate together to identify best practices and priorities for sustainable organization. Since 2018, we published the University Annual Sustainability Report, and we also organized the Sustainable De Development Festival, which lasts one week. On the teaching side, our university offers degree courses dealing with sustainability and the environment, including architecture, regeneration and sustainability, architecture and, sustainab and sustainable cities, engineering for the environment and the territory, environmental and natural sciences, geological sciences applied to environmental sustainability, innovative and sustainable animal production, and also a European master on urban regener regeneration anal analysis techniques for the protection and redevelopment of built environment. Uh, in what is important for this event today is also that our university plays an active role to propose regeneration strategies for the unused building, block, building stock, sorry, in Parma, in tight collaboration with the municipal administration and the major stakeholders, including several uh, industries of the cities on the Parma territories. These strategies include the use of ancient buildings for hosting a mix of student residences, spaces for innovative youth, youth entrepreneurship, sorry, <laughs> exhibitions, archives, and museums. They also include the use of former industrial sheds to create spaces of intellectual contamination for innovative startups and university spin-offs. Moreover, in collaboration with the government of the Emilia-Romagna region, the municipalities, industrial association, national and regional parks, and banking foundation of the province of Parma, our university is strongly engaged to design the operational strategy towards carbon neutrality. This is a very ambitious, strongly challenging, and long-lasting goal that implies redesigning lifestyles, building construction strategy towards positive energy districts, logistics and transport, production processes, land use and reforestation, and so on, towards a sustainable organization of our society. Finally, this is also very important, I, I believe, at our university we are well aware that the road towards a su sustainable life must include a three, the three fundamental components of sustainability. That is the environment, economic and social dimensions. Without such a, an, an holistic view, privileging only one of the three dimensions without considering interdependence and complementarity with the others, risks being partial and therefore scarcely effective. Accordingly, accordingly, we pay a particular attention to social inclusion policies, also through the University Penitentiary Center, Inclusion and Reception Center for Students with Disabilities, Center for Social Research, Rights, Society and Civilization, and the University Center for International Cooperation, specifically focused on developing countries. The active participation to the Network of Universities for Peace and to the Working Group on Social Justice of the Sustainable Universities Network. Particular attention is also paid to the culture of health care, right to food and proper nutrition, corporate social responsibility. In the three pillars of, of university activity, namely teaching, research, and third mission, these principles intersect each other, just as the consequent actions are interdependent. We should have a vision, the European vision is toward, but at least in Parma, I, I, I guess in, in many other cities, we are trying to anticipate this, this moment of, towards uh, carbon neutrality and sustainability, so maybe 2035, 2040. It's a long-lasting process, we can, we also because our cities are quite old, so the design of the city it, it was made in a very different era. 
So it's not also easy to change our minds, so which, which is also another very important parameter. The organization of the society has to be changed. This is what we are trying, but we are just starting by yes. signing a big alliance. You know, yeah. We are signing a big document where everybody in our territory, every organization is, uh, is engaged. In yes, yes I, I, I think also that probably the, uh, the new trend is to sign policies exactly to yeah. understand how we can manage this transition, how we can change the law and also ancient law and how we can improve technology in the old cities because yeah. it's also a question of technology and uh, how we can uh, also mm, move our ideas, our aesthetic ideas, that is not just the results, the beauty of the city, but are the process and involving people. So we are properly to change our mind to solve this question. No, I just would like to say once more that uh, uh, this event is, uh, for me, this is a start. Maybe it started already, uh, not maybe, I already saw that this movement already started uh, earlier this year. So I'm very glad uh, to join people who uh, think a lot about regeneration of cities and uh, uh, also a lot of other topics. And uh, I... I uh, would like to express my readiness to share uh, from the name of my committee and from the name of my uh, friends. Uh, I would like to share uh, my knowledge and also to participate in every new um, initiative which will be directed to the people's well-being, people's happiness and also some uh, um, uh, directions of sustainability. <coughs> of, uh, and that's it. Thank you so much. And Thank it was you. nice to uh, listen to all panelists and participants. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, I just wanted to make a commentary, if I may. Thank also. you, yes. Just wanted to uh, yeah, remind us that the SDGs is the biggest collaborative uh, project in the history of the United Nations. So it was more than one million and a half uh, people that were uh, uh, surveyed, uh, more than 1,500 specialists for 193 countries that signed the SDGs. So they are truly a common global language for us to work in a sustainable way. So to engage not only, as we saw, the C40 uh, city halls and local governments, but also businesses to create a culture where businesses uh, are a force for good and where we cre can create the logic of a market which is uh, driven by the common good, uh, social and environmental. So the SDGs is a big way, a big tool and framework uh, to help us uh, collaborate with different stakeholders in the city level. And also just to mention two B Corps, uh, which in my opinion are case of regeneration one is called Guayaki. Guayaki, it's a company that has a regenerative business model and they work in a very uh, beautiful way, regenerating the soil. They have managed to regenerate more than 80,000 hectares of soil, producing a energetic drink uh, based on yerba mate. Uh, and also Aboca. Aboca, it's an Italian uh, company also that uh, works in a regenerative way they are localized in San Polcro, Arezzo, yeah. and it's a very, very interesting uh, company that is working on the regeneration of health connected to nature and society. So yeah, that's it, thank and thank you very much for a beautiful event on regeneration. Thank you, Thomas. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, it was really, really good that we had to talk about, we had to have this um, conversation, and um, Thomas, um, seeing your presentation is like, um, a roadmap, a solution to really adapting to achieving this SGSD goal. I must tell you that this is the first time I'm seeing it, and this is like something that will help other countries. And we in Lagos, in Nigeria, have been trying to see how we can work with the government and trying to see how we can get them to increase the budget. But I must say that um, the city of Lagos is a, is, a, is, a, is a concern to the world because we have almost every part of the people in the world that live in this city. There must be a change. There must be an action plan for this um, city. That is why we are passionate about this city. 
we're calling for co uh, collaboration and support because the city comes with a whole huge lot of uh, opportunities. And also to Nana, I, I really appreciate the fact that uh, we have this museum. There's something we're doing in Lagos. It's called the Museum for the History of the Yoruba People. I, I think it would be good for you to see it. It's under construction. And also part of the things I showed in my slide, the National Art Theatre, Theater. I would really, really appreciate to see what you can do about this building. This was a building that was done in 1977 when they were celebrating the World Black History Festival in the world in 1977. This building today is a sleeping monument. Nothing is being done about it. We have written different articles about it. I really appreciate if there's something that ICOM can do about this um, building and also to see how they can help us in Nigeria to be able to document our own um, history. There's a whole lot of things that we are doing, and I'm using this opportunity to reach out to people, also that like Katrina, the C40, to see what the mayors in the world can see to support this um, city. Because by 2100, 20, it's going to be a huge disaster if infrastructure and, and things are not done. This, the country, the state is beginning to talk about smart city. And for me, you can't talk about smart city when you don't have good infrastructure because infrastructure is the bedrock of smart city. So for me and other, uh, Mandela has been to Lagos and is a city of mixed feeling, is a city of cry, is a city of happiness, a city of joy. People still find a way to enjoy themselves. So it's not always the total bad news for Lagos. Lagos is a city that I always I tell people to come in and you see we are very open to collaborate with the entire world. Thank you for this program and we're open to see you again. Thank you, Mandela and every other person. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, my panelists. Thank you, all the people is here. And obviously, the organization of Regeneration 2030 who trusts in the importance of this uh, roundtable. So thank you, and see you in another occasion. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.